Good morning. My name is Christopher Shea, and it is my honor as the current president of the Maryland section for the American Society of Civil Engineers to welcome everybody here this morning. We are here to celebrate, mark, and dedicate the Thomas Viaduct as a national historical civil engineering landmark. Uh, this celebration is a culmination of years of hard work and dedication, and the plaque at the entrance will serve as a reminder of the Thomas Viaduct's historical value for years to come. I'd like to thank you all for coming, uh, with a special thanks to the volunteers, Ken, and everybody that uh, helped make this event possible, and a special thanks to the Patapsco Valley State Park for allowing us to have the ceremony here this morning. Um, and with that being said, I'd like to introduce Sam Vasso, Vasso, sorry, Vasso, yeah. Vasso um, with the Patapsco Valley State Park to say a few words. Good morning. How y'all feeling? Good morning. Awesome. I, you know, as as, uh, as as much as I just heard the you know thanks for you know uh, thanks to Tapsco for you all being here, I wanted to say thank you to you all uh, for coming here, uh, for for you know, for coming to the park, for enjoying this beautiful day, and uh, and just as much for appreciating the historical value of this area. Uh, you know, the Thomas Viaduct is the you know, is the like the, kind of like the crown jewel of history in this area. Come on, win, cooperate. Uh, crown jewel is kind of the, kind of the you know, crown jewel of history, you know, uh, the historical structure for this area. But we, this this area, you know, from the entrance all the way back to Orange Grove, just has so much history to offer. Uh, so during your time here today, I, I would really like to encourage you to uh, explore uh, explore as much of the park as you can. Uh, but uh, but uh, most especially to uh, explore our history center, uh, which you can find if you head directly back across the bridge. Uh, and you'll see uh, you'll see the parking lot and sign the history center there. Uh, there's so much uh, so much to learn there uh, about this area and in, uh, in the history. Uh, you can meet our uh, one of our uh, uh, one of our staff members, our park historian uh, Max Buffington, who would love 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 to talk to you about the history of this area. Uh, and you can also see some uh, uh, some red-tailed hawks over there while you're at it. Uh, so again, thank you so very much for coming. I look forward to uh, uh, to hearing all of these speakers, and I hope you do as well. Take care. Thank you, Sam. I'd now like to introduce Tom Smith. He is our executive director for American Society of Civil Engineers to uh, provide the plaque dedication. Okay, that'd be good. Thank you, Tom. Well, good morning. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank morning. you all for being here. I want to uh, thank all the ASC members that uh, worked on this. Uh, we've got over 160,000 members now in 177 countries. Uh, and this is an organization that was created back in 1852, as you see on this uh, uh, below the shield here. Uh, so it was created, uh, you know, a couple of decades after this uh, viaduct that we're celebrating here. Uh, we do a lot of work at ASCE recognizing the civil engineering and advancing the civil engineering profession. Uh, we're working on designing projects now that are going to last, you know, for 100 or more years. Uh, we're not often thinking about 200 you know, years is what we're approaching here with this viaduct. So this is really impressive. It's an incredible thing to celebrate and recognize the, the, the work that civil engineers have done uh, over the centuries. Uh, so it's a great honor to uh, represent uh, the civil engineering profession at the American Society of Civil Engineers. Uh, we were, as I mentioned, founded in 1852. So, so for more than 170 years, we stood at the forefront of a profession that is building uh, our quality of life and protecting our quality of life. Uh, we, for more than 50 years, we've had a civil engineering historic landmark program. So we created this back in 1966. The first project we actually recognized with our civil engineering uh, historic landmark designations was the Bowman Trust Bridge. Uh, also here in Maryland, so in Savage, Maryland. So you got quite a history here in Maryland uh, on, on, for, for the civil engineering profession. Uh, the elite group of, of uh, projects that we have recognized includes projects like the Panama Canal, the Golden Gate Bridge, the Sydney Opera House, the Eiffel Tower, uh, as well as lesser known uh, projects like engineering achievements such as the Granite Railway, the first commercial railway in the United States. And again, with the Bowman Trust Bridge, that was a B&O railway, and here we are looking at another uh, railway viaduct that's used for not only freight but also passenger rail. Uh, ASC's History and Heritage Committee uh, nominates historically significant civil engineering projects for recognition in this ongoing <laughs> program. They work extremely hard. They do an enormous amount of research, and it's quite, a, it's quite an honor to be recognized as a, as a his, civil engineering historic landmark. Uh, they're very actively, actively involved in this process. It's not an easy task. 
We're proud today to recognize the Thomas Viaduct, uh, completed in 1835. Again, it's just shocking that, it's, that, that it was that long ago. It's the first multi-span uh, masonry railroad bridge built on a curving alignment in the United States. So that's quite a challenge, quite a task. Since then, it has served as a crucial railway link for Maryland's active freight system. ASC originally designated the viaduct as a National Civil Engineering Landmark in 2010, but in commemoration of its long-standing importance throughout, the local, uh, throughout local history, we'd like to honor the viaduct today by highlighting its significance as an engineering marvel uh, with a plaque. I'll read for you the plaque that we're uh, de uh, uh, dedicating here today. Um, and this is for a National Historic Civil Engineering Landmark of the American Society of Civil Engineers. This, the, the Thomas Viaduct is the first multi-span masonry railroad bridge built on a curving alignment in the United States. One of the challenges with the curved plan was designing the eight cylindrical arches on a skew with piers that were trapezoidal in plan. Only civil engineers are going to use the word trapezoidal at the back. The viaduct was designed by civil engineer Benjamin H. Latrobe, Jr., 1806 to 1878, and constructed by the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. It was a critical link for the first rail line into Washington, D.C., and it continues in 2023 to carry mainline railroad traffic. It was constructed in 1835, designated in 2010. As civil engineers, we take great pride uh, in, in building structures and sites that become legacies for our communities. We're celebrating uh, the work of civil engineers. We're just releasing, I was, in fact, I was in Los Angeles last week. We were releasing an uh, uh, IMAX film called Cities of the Future. And we're highlighting projects around the world and, and cer certainly in the United States that are forward-looking and future-ready. And you can see what happened back in the 18, early 1800s. We had a bunch of civil engineers that were really looking way into the future. Can you imagine what they were thinking if they would know that 200 years, almost 200 years from now, uh, from then, uh, we would be out here celebrating the work that they did. So it's a, quite an amazing achievement. Uh, and the work that civil engineers are doing today, though, uh, hundreds of years from now, we're going to be having the same kind of impact. I'm quite sure of that. And we're looking at making sure that we're addressing some of these extreme weather conditions and other things that we're facing as a, as a, as a nation and as a planet. I want to thank the Maryland section for nominating this structure as a civil engineering landmark for hosting this wonderful event. Civil engineers are not always in the spotlight. Often they're working behind the scenes and often, unfortunately, come in the spotlight when there are extreme conditions that impact our, our infrastructure. But we'd like to celebrate them at all times. That's why we're releasing an IMAX film, like I just mentioned. And we did one five years ago called Dream Bing for the same reason, uh, for the, to recognize the heroes that are doing this kind of work. So please, um, uh, civil engineers, uh, I want to mention this landmark stands as a testament to human innovation. It will be recognized for generations to come. Please join me in celebrating the Thomas Viaduct as an ASC historic engineering landmark. Thank you all. Thank you, Tom. Uh, now to give a little bit of historical background on the viaduct, I will uh, call up Jonathan Goldman. He is the chief curator at the B&O Railroad, Railroad Museum. Good morning, everybody. Um, I have 10-week-old twins at home, so uh, my body's here. We'll see if my mind arrives with it, but um, here we go. I, also, I want to mention, if you haven't already checked it out, uh, we have some folks with different materials for you guys to see. We have the Maryland Transit Administration, MTA. Um, of course, I brought some uh, information here from the museum if the wind doesn't take it away. I encourage you to look at it. Uh, Patapsco Heritage Greenway, as well as, of course, the Patapsco Valley State Park. And again, thank you to the park for letting us do this today. Um, so I'm gonna share with you a little bit of the history, not the engineering side. We will hear about that after. So crossing the, the Patapsco River and spanning the surrounding valley, the Thomas Viaduct connects Relay and Elk Ridge, Maryland. The bridge is named after Philip E. Thomas, the pioneering first president of America's first common carrier railroad, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Due to its historic significance, the viaduct was designated a National Historic Landmark in 1964. This engineering marvel was designed by Benjamin Henry Latrobe II, son of famed Benjamin Latrobe, who designed the Baltimore Basilica in the U.S. Capitol Building. Latrobe II, at the time, was the assistant engineer of the B&O Railroad and would later become the chief engineer for the company. 
Latrobe seemingly passed on his family's engineering prowess to his son, Charles H. Latrobe, who went on to serve as the B&O's chief engineer for 25 years. Latrobe's designs were ambitious, to say the least. The viaduct would be, for the time, a gargantuan 612 feet long and 59 feet high. Each arch would span 58 feet. The Roman arch style structure would be made of woodstock granite, a unique stone native to here, the Patapsco Valley. At the time when most bridges were made of wood, the decision to use granite would prove either foolish or revolutionary. But most ambitious was Latrobe's choice to have the viaduct curve across the river, for no curved bridge had ever been made in the United States prior to that point. Appearing impossible to many, the project was referred to as Latrobe's Folly by, their, by his critics. Only the best could be trusted to fulfill Latrobe's vision, and to this end, the b and Railroad hired John McCartney, the man responsible for completing the Patterson viaduct in 1826, which was the first bridge they built on the b and tracks, which is just at the end of the museum's property in Baltimore. As a Quaker and abolitionist, b and President Philip E. Thomas barred the company and its subcontractors from using slave labor to construct the railroad. Thus, McCartney led a team of immigrant laborers primarily from Ireland and Germany. The contribution of the Irish was especially, pro especially profound. When the urban heat became unbearable in the summertime, Irish rail, rail workers and their families would live in tents here in the Patapsco Valley for months on end. Despite the difficult living and working conditions, McCartney's laborers completed the time Thomas Viaduct within two years, 1833 to 1835. The entire project cost the B&O roughly $142,000 the equivalent of about $4 million today. When the viaduct was, which probably seems cheap for a, for a railroad bridge. Uh, I heard some laughing. <laughs> it was a lot for back then. When the viaduct was finished, supporters and critics of the structure gathered around to watch a steam locomotive test Latrobe's design. Latrobe was so confident in, in his creation that he chose to ride aboard the locomotive himself. As we know, the Thomas Viaduct held strong beneath the weight of the locomotive, and Latrobe and McCartney successful, successfully completed their vision. In recent years, we at the B&O Railroad Museum have documented 27 enslaved African Americans who rode the B&O on the Underground Railroad to freedom. At least nine of these freedom seekers traveled over the viaduct by rail from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore. Historians are continuing to learn that the Thomas Viaduct may have been a likely site of significance for many additional freedom seekers on the Underground Railroad traveling by foot as the structure served as the only straight path across the Pat Patapsco River. And thus it was the safest and quickest way for them to traverse the potentially dangerous waters dividing Elk Ridge and Relay. During the American Civil War, Union troops were stationed on the viaduct to protect this vital transportation link. Had Confederate forces destroyed the viaduct Washington, D.C. would have lost its only supply line from the northern states. This did not come to pass, however, as the Union sol soldiers thwarted all attempts to sabotage the viaduct. In 1873, the B&O built the Viaduct Hotel and Station, just next to the viaduct. This combination hotel and structure featured a three-story hotel and two-story station building. It was constructed with rich materials and featured a two-story stone rear balcony that overlooked the Patapsco and the viaduct. Its use as a hotel never really took off for long-distance commuters since they wound up mostly staying in Baltimore, um, as they had intended it to, and visitation dwindled into the turn of the century. By 1938, the station closed down and the structure then burned to the ground in 1950 after sitting vacant for 12 years. In the years after the Civil War, the Thomas Viaduct was used to support the B&O's premier passenger lines. Between the 1880s and 1950s, the viaduct was part of the Royal Blue Line connecting New York and Washington, D.C. Until the late 1960s, it was also part of the Capital Limited passenger service connecting to Chicago and St. Louis. Today, marked trains continue this legacy of passenger travel across the Patapsco River on the viaduct. Since its unveiling, the Thomas Viaduct has stimulated local economies.
Thanks to the viaduct, the traders of Baltimore had a direct route to Relay, and thus they had direct access to the mills and factories of the Patapsco Valley. For years after its completion, the viaduct was the only means of transporting goods by rail between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. Therefore, the Thomas Viaduct has contributed greatly to the economic growth of the Washington-Baltimore Corridor. To this day, the viaduct serves as a vital pipeline for East Coast goods traveling on CSX trains. For engineers, the viaduct is heralded as the largest multiple arched stone railroad bridge or the world's oldest multiple arched stone bridge built on a curve. The structure withstood the Great Flood of 1868 and Hurricane Agnes in 1972, two events that devastated much of the region. Perhaps its most notable fact is that it is still being used to carry freight trains by the B&O's inheritor, CSX, as well as marked trains, as most bridges from this time period have long since been replaced. As we approach the 200th anniversary of America's first railroad, and therefore American railroading itself in 2027, the Thomas Viaduct remains a significant historical and engineering marvel to continue to be celebrated into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. I would now like to call up uh, Michael O'Connor. He is the head of our History and Heritage Committee uh, for ASCE Maryland. correct one point, Ken Durenbacher is head, and I want to really give a thanks to Ken because he really deserves credit for this. I was in the uh, 18 to 21 time frame trying to move this forward, and so I want to note Ken's activity and want to thank Ken. We're really here today because of his I had the unenviable job of trying to convey the engineering history of Thomas to a bunch of non-engineers, so it should be interesting. So I will try not to uh, get too deep into the details, but try to keep it accessible. I'm going to be talking two parts today. I'm going to be talking about the B&O and the Latrobes, and then I'll talk a little bit about the viaduct and how that has served over the years. Uh, Latrobe himself is kind of interesting. The whole family is interesting. The father uh, left France uh, to it uh, during the uh, uh, revolutionary time frame came over to the United States and did engineering work and architectural work and uh, he had uh, he was obviously as, as uh, uh, previously talked about was involved in the nation's capital he was involved in Baltimore uh, items and he went down to uh, New Orleans unfortunately in developing the water supply for New Orleans he died of the yellow fever in 20, 1820, and his oldest boy died in 1817. So the family was marked by tragedy in that regard. They had a bunch of other children, the youngest of which was Benjamin, who built the bridge himself, and his older brother. And the reason why I bring up his older brother was John, because the interesting about the two of them, first off, John was the one in the family who was meant to be the engineer. And Benjamin was meant to, since it was kind of like the, the third or fourth estate, since Benjamin wasn't going to be an engineer, they said, you, 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 be, you be a lawyer. So John went to West Point, and back in that time, West Point was an engineering school. So if you went there, you were an engineer. So he worked with Thayer, and he, was, he graduated from West Point, and he worked in engineering as part of the early uh, Corps of Engineers. He decided that was not what he wanted, and he went into law. Benjamin graduated from St. Mary's in Baltimore, and then went to Georgetown for law, practiced for a year and said, I'm not interested in this. So he went up to New Jersey and he, his mother owned a lot of land in New Jersey. And so he went up there and he, he worked on conveying property, but his heart really got into serving. He joined, he would go out in the fields with the surveyors and survey the properties and everything like that. And after about a year or two up in New Jersey, he could decide I'm, I'm not for this. So he came down to Baltimore and he tried to get a job down in Baltimore. And at that point, his brother, had been working for the B&O Railroad in their law department, so his brother got him his first job working in the B&O lawyer legal office. So he did about a year or so of that and decided, this is not for me, I wanna work on the engineering field on the surveying side. So his brother pulled some strings and got him moved over from the law office over to the survey gangs. So he was involved in doing some of the work from Ellicott City out to Frederick. Now right in this period in time, 
uh, he already had the survey background, but he hadn't done anything more than that. So there was a little fracas going on between Baltimore and Ohio in this group called the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. Uh -huh. So Chesapeake and Ohio went out and got an injunction against B&O that said they couldn't do anything in Frederick County, let alone get over to Pointer Rocks, which is where they were going. Uh -huh. So he suddenly found himself out of work. So during that period of time, Baltimore and Ohio had a franchise to build a railroad from Baltimore to Washington called the Baltimore and Washington Railroad. So then the Jonathan Knight, who was the chief engineer, uh, told uh, what told Latrobe and this other engineer Rainey, you guys start laying out the railroad down to Washington. Now Knight put a restriction. Now this is not the best route, and this is not the route that Latrobe wanted to follow going to Washington. If you see where the Guinness, uh, where that Guinness uh, warehouse is today, that's where Latrobe wanted to build it. We wanted to build it on the flat, basically follow the railroad, the route that the Penzi followed later on. Knight wouldn't let him do it. Knight said he had to stay. He could no closer than seven miles to Pratt Street. He couldn't break branch off the railroad less than seven miles from Pratt, which forced him to that point there. So here he is. Knight says, you got to start here and go south. And at that point, Latrobe realized, well, the only way I can get from here to there is I'm at that grade. And so that's why the viaduct was built. That's why it was necessary was the fact that the original planning for it, now keep in mind that at this point in time, Wellington was still, who was the father of railroad economics, was still 40 years into the future. And so the economic location of railroads as a concept wasn't published till late 1870s. So the Baltimore Railroad initially had horrific curves, uh, had 400 foot radius curves. And so we had, a. that's why it was necessary that Baltimore and Ohio Railroad started off as a tramway. It didn't start off as a railroad. So they weren't worried about curvature at that point. So they, so if you think about it, what the railroad was at that point was a laboratory for the United States. The technology we evolved, if you think about it, when the Baltimore Railroad started, we were still using inclined planes. So we still had steam engines at the top of the hill lifting the cars up the hill. We didn't even think that the railroads had enough horsepower. If you look at the Philadelphia and Columbia Railroad, had an inclined plane, Baltimore had an inclined parse ridge. So that was where we were in the 1820 time frame. So in the span of these years, we went from inclined planes to steam locomotives to higher speeds. We weren't worried about 400 foot radius curves back then because we weren't doing more than three or four miles an hour. So Latrobe in that period moved from short lines of the railroad to where by 1850, the mid 1850s, we were out to Wheeling, West Virginia, or back then was Wheeling, you know, Wheeling, Ohio, Wheeling, Virginia, and Ohio. Wheeling, Ohio, I got my states right. <laughs> anyway, watch my time here. <coughs> so the irony is that for the Latrobes, John was trained as the engineer, went into law. Benjamin was trained as a lawyer, went into engineering. So Knight says to Latrobe, cross the valley. And, and the instructions from Knight to Latrobe were to give me a, basically build a masonry viaduct in engineering terms, in lay terms, build a stone bridge. Latrobe was not trained as an engineer. And so he read a book. <laughs> he did. He, went, he read this book by this French engineer from the 1740s who was the second director of the French engineering school, Perenet. And, and he read his book on designing the Pont de Neuilly Bridge in France. And in that book, he talked about designing masonry bridges. And the Thomas Viaduct is patterned after the French bridge, the French bridge school, the French National Engineering School in that regard. Now, that, there's an interesting aspect of that that I'll come back to. But back at that point in, in, in Latrobe's time, engineers designed bridges by geometry. Okay? We didn't have a stress theory. We didn't have a, a theory of stress in the 1830s. So we mainly had rules of thumb. So you would have a, a rise, you'd have a rise, the depth of the arch over the span, and the critical diameter is what does the arch ring look like? So when you look at Thomas, if you look at the stones that form the arch, look at the thickness of that stone. So that's the most critical engineering decision. That's based on the span versus the rise. They weren't looking at loads. They weren't looking necessarily at the strength of the stone. They were looking at geometry. But they were assuming the material they're working with was infinitely strong. What the engineers didn't realize till the mid 20th century was it takes a column over 6,000 feet tall to crush granite. Think about that. 
it takes a, over a mile high of granite to crush the first course. So a British engineer called Jacques Hyman who laid this out in a thing called the stone skeleton. And what, he, what his argument was that granite was such a considerably stronger material than what we were doing, that it was no wonder that the structures constructed in the Middle Ages, the Gothic cathedrals, could handle the loads that they did and lasted the long time that they did. His analysis indicated that most of these structures on a stress basis were only working to five to 10% of the capacity. And I would argue that today, that the Thomas Viaduct, if you would look at that, is, is operating about 10% of the structural capacity of what that material can handle, okay? Mm. Which is why people say today, like, oh my God, you know, look at what it was designed for. From an engineering point of view, it was like 300 pounds an axle probably back then to a three, 300 ton locomotive today. Okay, in that regard, it was like, oh my God, like, how could it handle it? Well, if you think of a structure that's only operating at 10% of its capacity, okay? If it's operating at a, at a three ton or five ton and it's operating in a sense of 20 times that, it's got a 600 ton capacity. The other thing Heyman found is most of the masonry structures were built in Europe had a 500 year life. He documented a number of English cathedrals and bridges that had, uh, that had about a 500 year and then mysteriously collapsed all at once. So I would predict that Thomas has easily has another uh, 200 or 300 years worth of service in, in that regard. Uh, CSX will keep it for 300 years, I don't know. So, so we have this situation where you have this uh, design. He's following the, the handbook. He's following that. It was a geometry. He had been trained in mathematics. He knew that. He worked with a, a, a good set of masonry people. Watch my time in that regard. But what was interesting was we didn't understand. I'll, I've got three minutes and I'll close this up. Was Thomas the same structure it was in 1835? And it isn't. They made some changes. What they realized in the late 19th century was that the way Latrobe designed Thomas is he the way the design was, he didn't pick up one point that the French knew was he put only three centers into the bridge and he put a stress concentration into the haunches. And so he went from a 35 foot radius to a 23 foot radius. And so he put a stress concentration in there. Okay? And so when it came back in the 19th century, what you did, if you look at the Wikipedia article, in fact, you can see it right there. If you open up that, you'll see that one blueprint that's in the bridge, or you'll see it in the, in the handout. It's, it's, it's there, it's the blue line drawing. And you'll see right there, the one on your left. And you'll see that they put concrete in there, the three cells. And why did they do that? And they did that because they realized that there was a stress concentration in there and the, uh, we just hold this up like this. It's this drawing here, and what you see is that they show that they pour concrete in here. And by doing that, what they did is they cut the, they cut the depth of the arch by a third. And they took that stress point and they put concrete behind it. The way masonry arches fail is they get a hinge. The stress is such that the arch breaks, the back of it breaks. And so what they did is they put concrete behind the arch ring and effectively raised the depth of the arch up by that distance, about six feet. And what that did is that hit that one weakness in the arch and took care of it. So they structurally modified the arch to remove that bottom weakness. So they converted it from a multi-center arch to a single center arch, okay? So that's the only real one that they did. The rest of the structure's the same. I predict it's got another three, using the British structural recommendations, it has another 300 years of life in it. Uh, it's being well cared for, and uh, and I'm within a minute. So there it goes. <laughs> on time, on budget, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. I, uh, I'm always awed at his memory. Uh, he had no notes. notes, nothing, that was just purely off the top of his head. So uh, thank you again. Your historical knowledge on this is pretty uh, remarkable. Uh, I'd now like to bring up David Johnson. Uh, he is the Deputy Director of Operations at MDOT MTA with uh, Mark Train. Hi, good morning. Uh, uh, yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, as said, my name is Dave Johnson, uh, Deputy Director of Operations for Mark Train. Uh, I bring regards from our administrator, Holly Arnold. She apologizes. She had a, a family situation come up this morning. She was not able to uh, join us today. She 
uh, apologizes for not being here, but sends her best. And I also uh, bring greetings from uh, MDOT Secretary Paul Wiederfeld, uh, thanking uh, everyone for gathering here today and for celebrating this beautiful bridge. Um, and we, um, the, the Thomas Viaduct, as other speakers have mentioned, is an important, it was a critical link for the Mark Camden line. Uh, our service from Baltimore Camden Station to Washington, um, part of the first railroad in the United States. Um, our trip from Camden Station roughly down to St. Dennis is part of you know, the original passenger service in America. So we're, we're a very historical operation and we, we, we celebrate that history at Mark Train. Um, as other speakers have said, the, the, what we now know as the Camden Line, the, the passenger service began in the, the middle 1830s and has continued uh, to this day um, you know, of course, as uh, B&O, Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, into the Chessie system and CSX. Um, and then in the uh, mid, mid 60s, uh, late mid 60s, uh, early 70s, the state of Maryland began subsidizing uh, the passenger service. Uh, it was operating at a loss. Um, and the, the, there was the foresight to save the service and knowing that it was a vital uh, commuting uh, option for the four people in Maryland to get to Washington and folks from Washington to come up to uh, Baltimore. Um, the, um, the, the, the service was initially, when the, when the state took it over, the service was kind of was overseen by MDOT through the State Rail Division. In 1992, it was brought into the Maryland Transit Administration. Many of you are familiar with the uh, bus, light rail, metro service here in Baltimore. Um, Mark ridership continues to grow. Uh, obviously, like all other commuter railroads, we were pretty heavily impacted by COVID. Uh, our ridership you know, in March of 2020 dropped to virtually nothing. Um, we have been recovering and continue to recover. I'm, I'm glad to report that we had our, uh, the month of March, we had our strongest ridership month uh, since the pandemic began. Uh, we continue to, uh, to rebound that and we're, we're continuing to look how to evolve our service because um, everybody uses the term the new normal. Um, the nine to five Monday through Friday commute is, I don't wanna say it's gone, but it's, it's in a, a lot of ways is gone. Um, and it's, you know, it, we're looking for ways to evolve, and I think one of the, well, I know one of the ways we're really doing that is uh, an exercise that MTA is undertaking now called the Mark Growth and Transformation Plan. Some of you may be familiar with previous efforts that were called the Mark uh, Growth and Investment Plan. There was the Mark Cornerstone Plan, some other over the years, but we really felt it was critical in this effort to put the word transformation, because we really are looking to transform Mark and evolve it into the post-pandemic uh, world and, and bring more people to the service. And to that extent, we're looking at uh, considering several options for growth uh, and uh, doing things differently at Mark. Um, we're looking at uh, extending our service uh, into Delaware um, on the Penn Line. Many folks have heard you heard the term closing the gap. Uh, the section of the Penn, of Amtrak's Northeast Quarter between Perryville and Newark, Delaware is one of the only segments between Washington and Boston without some element of commuter rail. So we are working with our partners in Delaware and at SEPTA uh, to close that gap, whatever form that takes. Is that us going to Newark? Is that SEPTA coming to Perryville? You know, we're, we're actively advancing that effort. Uh, we're also looking uh, with our partners in Virginia uh, and CSX uh, to go expand Mark service down into Virginia. There's been some news coverage recently about that. Uh, we have signed a memorandum of understanding with the Virginia uh, Rail Authority. Uh, it is not an agreement to start service, I want to be very clear, uh, but it is a memorandum of understanding to work with Virginia uh, to initiate MARC run-through service at a future date uh, where MARC trains would continue past Union Station on to uh, LaFont Plaza, Crystal City, Alexandria, maybe further. Uh, you know, again, that, that kind of, at this point, we're, we're, we're figuring out how that works. And also on our Brunswick line, we're, we're looking at some uh, improvements over there, again, in partnership with our... Uh, our good friends at CSX, uh, we've been working closely with them on uh, some some uh, big Brunswick line uh, expansion and growth plan there specifically to the Brunswick line, um, and I think we'll be we will be seeing some things here in the upcoming years about um, th that that line is a, a real challenge. That line is a nine to five commuter rail. There are nine trains in in the morning, nine trains out in the evening. That's probably not the greatest model uh, going forward into the post-pandemic world. So how can we grow that service, transform it, and evolve it into the post-pandemic world? Um, let's see, a couple other things here. Uh, we are also are working, again, in the terms of transformation, ways to attract more people to the service, not, not the traditional nine to five commuter, um, reaching out more to students. 
uh, leisure travelers. Our weekend service, I just left the Odenton station before I came here, and there were 100 passengers on the platform for the 945 train to DC on a Saturday. So, you know, that, that's our weekend service on the Penn line has recovered exponentially faster than the weekday service. We are basically back to pre-pandemic ridership on the weekends. Um, so I think that's a real opportunity for us as well and shows the potential for the other lines. Um, see, we, uh, you know, we at the MTA and, and as a whole are, are focused on improving transit, improving transit in the Baltimore region, na na nation's capital region, uh, and you know, making those links and making uh, the connections to get people where they need to go and offer transit as a viable option. So we will continue to do that. We appreciate your support. We appreciate the support of CSX. Uh, Amtrak, our other part, our host railroads as well. Uh, we, I, I will note, and Brian, Brian will be happy to hear this, uh, in March uh, we had our best on-time performance on the Camden line in almost three years. Uh, so we, we thank CSX and the passenger services team for making that happen and that they're a critical partner in our efforts to grow and transform our train. So thank you very much. Uh, congratulations to ASC and uh, all the uh, folks that went into making this uh, dedicating uh, dedicating this plaque to this wonderful viaduct and I don't know about y'all but I'm gonna stop at the library on the way home and check a book out and uh, work on designing a bridge so I got I got my afternoon plan thank you thank you uh, next up as uh, mentioned we have Brian Hammock Brian is the uh, resident vice president for CSX Good morning. Let's see if my hat stays on. Um, we're joined by two delegates uh, here today. I hope you heard that on time performance. Uh, Delegate Boucher from District 5 uh, over here who grew up playing in the valley here. And I saw Delegate Abershaw uh, hiding over here. Um, on behalf of CSX Transportation, your local Class 1 railroad. Um, that owns, operates, and maintains this beautiful structure that we're here to celebrate today. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, how many railroaders are in the audience here? Got at least one, or fans of the railroad. <laughs> Mr. McNew here, uh, retired from the Canton Railroad as an engineer. Not retired? Not retired. Okay. With the Canton Railroad uh, here in Baltimore. Um, I want to say on behalf of myself, I appreciate the chance uh, to join each of you um, on this great spring day uh, to honor the structure and tell a little bit about the current railroad story. We've heard about the past, but I'll start with some of the past. Um, since 1706, the people that chose to live around the deep water of the harbor of Baltimore and the surrounding countryside survived and thrive because of the free flow of diverse goods through the Port of Baltimore. It's no wonder that the predecessors in this place were able to advance to build such great structures so long ago. But imagine Baltimore in 1814. How many people would have starved for lack of basic necessities that moved through the harbor had the British Navy shut down our port for an extended period of time. 10 years later, those Baltimoreans decided that they were gonna start to build America's first railroad. As we celebrate this structure for its historic importance, celebrate it also for its current importance. One of our arteries is tragically shut down today for our economy. But as we stand here, five million Marylanders, our neighbors, are going on with their weekend plans like it's a regular weekend. They're visiting one of the 60 Walmarts in Maryland, one of the 40 Home Depots, one of the 30 Lowe's, or one of the 11 Costco's. Able to access goods that run their lives without noticing that we've suffered a heart attack in our supply chain by having the Port of Baltimore shuttered because of the tragedy at the Key Bridge. To the engineers here, and to those that you train, the younger ones coming up, I ask you, can we build this bridge today? Can we build a structure so important 
as to not only fuel a society as great as ours, but that call on people 100 years from now to join together to celebrate it. Fate has given us that challenge today with rebuilding the Keep Bridge, and I hope that we rise to that challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, with that, that is all of our speakers. Um, so I would like to once again thank everybody for attending, uh, thank our speakers for speaking on behalf of the viaduct and the history. Um, and then I'd like to give one last special thanks to uh, Daniel Vorstek, who uh, donated the granite rock that the plaque is sitting on. Uh, so I encourage you again, as you're leaving today, to stop and visit the plaque, check it out. Um, get a couple pictures in front of the viaduct. And uh, again, if you give us a few minutes, we're gonna get the food ready. Um, and again, thank you everybody. And oh, what? We're give give one more back. shout out to Ken and Bill. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you everybody. And uh, yeah, we'll stick around. And if you have any questions. Pardon me? The plaque is, I believe, if you look on. Uh, yeah. The